I'm Dr. Melanie Windridge, a physicist and mountaineer. I'm climbing Everest and I want to highlight the science that gets us to the summit. I've come to Anglia Ruskin University to talk to Justin Roberts about fitness training for climbing Everest. We conduct tests on anybody who, who's interested in their sport, health and exercise. So from novices through to professional athletes. And one of the things we do here is we try to help people with their understanding of how the science can benefit their training. What were we doing in the lab? What were you testing? When you come to a laboratory, uh, the point is to standardise the test. So every time you come in, it's the same equipment, same testers, same time of day, same conditions, so that we can start to compare the data mm -hmm. over time to see how your training is affecting your, your physiology. The test we've devised for you is a simulation of what you are likely to be doing on the outdoors. So it's never going to be Everest because it's really hard to, to emulate that. But what we've done for you today is we've looked at a walking protocol in a loaded and an unloaded state and in, on an incline and a non-incline uh, to see basically how your body responds to, to those intensities. Beyond that, we've also done what's called a lactate profile test. So this is where we have you exercising at slightly different intensities every few minutes to look at the increased exercise intensity and your response to that. And then we've finished this all off with a nice little max test, which is where we push you to your maximum ability in the shortest possible time as a way of finding out how generally fit you are. The data tells them when you're tired. <laughs> you can't pretend. <laughs> shows up in your blood. <laughs> they have been testing my fitness at intervals over the past year to see whether I'm making progress. So Patrick, are you going to tell me how I've done on my fitness testing? From taking the body fat, body composition, um, it is primarily fat that you've lost, okay. which is excellent because the less fat you have, the more efficient you become in moving your body. Your fat-free mass, so this is the muscle and also the bones and your organs, hasn't changed at all compared to your last test. So you've been able to maintain the muscle mass as well as lose fat. So that's a really good sign. Okay. Just as a matter of interest, has my maximum ability changed at all? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in a so, good way or a bad In a good way. way. <laughs> so part of the thing you've been doing over the last few months is trying to increase your, your exercise economy uh, and also increase your, your ability to push yourself a little bit harder and a little bit further. So in today's results what that translates to it doesn't sound much but your maximum oxygen uptake is about just under half a litre more oxygen per minute than you were three months ago so it doesn't sound much but what that means is at the muscle level at the cell level your body's using uh, or able to push to a much uh, greater level than it did before. So the answer to your question is yes, you're a little bit fitter. If I'm using that oxygen a bit more efficiently, it means that when I go higher and there is less oxygen available, I should still be able to perform. That's the plan. Perform. That's the plan. And we're starting to see the first start signs of that. And mm -hmm. I think the next three months in terms of your training are going to be quite crucial in a way. Altitude is difficult to train for because mm -hmm. being fit doesn't necessarily mean that you'll perform well. Mm. So yeah, Correct. how do you make those decisions about well, what to, how to train? It's a very difficult one because um, you know, you, this is where you have to look at the person and work with the person. So, I mean, you've said twice today alone that one of the things you, you find you, you struggle with is the ability to push to, you know, under maximum conditions. Now, mm. that could be something that's worth considering, is especially when you're, you're going up against Everest. Mm. And not that it's about running at maximum levels or having a very high fitness, but you know, knowing that your heart rate is going to suddenly elevate because of the hypoxia mm. uh, is something worth looking at. I feel that my endurance is quite good. I mean, I can mm. just keep going through mm. discomfort or pain or mm. that kind of thing. But it's the very high level pushing mm. that I just sort of pull back from. Having done a little bit of altitude myself, I would say the fitness doesn't really come into it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it's more about your ability to be mentally strong, to be efficient throughout the day uh, and to maintain that drive to want to eat and drink. I think they're, they're the three big things. I work full time mm -hmm. and this is the trickiest thing when it comes to training. You have to kind of, number one, have a structure, have a plan. Yeah. You know, maximising the time you have and looking at opportune periods in the week or months. So for example, you might do weight training in the morning, but you might do a run with a club in the evening and that might be two sessions for that week. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really comes down to having that plan first, I think. If I can improve my fitness a little bit, but if I can also train like specifically for the mountain by doing things like longer walks and improving like the, the lower level, like base level fitness, then mm. 
that should help. And Definitely. I can use things yeah. like heart rate monitors to inform my training so I can keep in the right kind of zones, zones yeah. when I'm training. So I'll be back again just before I go to Everest yeah. in March. So I'll look forward to Great. seeing you then. And in the meantime, anything I should really be working on. But I would certainly spend some time thinking about the, the structure to your training in the next 12 weeks and we can certainly help you with that. I'd also, the other thing I would, I would start to think about is the specific preparation in terms of nutrition. Maybe just start trialing some of the, the food groups so you've got time to practice. And the rest of it is just really, you know, getting ready for the, the main event. So as, as specific training as you can from here on. Besides conventional fitness training, there are also some other ways that I might be able to get an edge. I'm going to visit Power Breathe to find out about improving my breathing efficiency. So what can be the benefits of training my inspiratory muscles? So if you pre-train your intercostal muscles in your rib cage, they can expand against the resistance and you can also train your diaphragm, which will help you with your core posture, but also help to suck in more air at the same time. So it sounds like it could be really helpful for climbers summiting something like Everest. Breathing is a very important part of climbing because your respiratory muscles are working so much harder and they're more likely to fatigue because of the demands on your body of A, the kit that you're carrying and B, the, the percentage of the oxygen levels that you're, you're able to, to take in. When did the concept of power breathe and training in spiritual muscles come about? 20 years ago it was developed at Loughborough University and the original device looked like this. So essentially it's a spring-loaded valve as you breathe in, you create a vacuum in the chamber, the valve will open, and as long as you can maintain the pressure to keep that valve open, it will stay open and then eventually it will close. So is this just making it harder to breathe? It is making it harder to breathe. So you would start off at a low resistance, but maintain a good breathing technique. I've been training with Power Breathe already for the last month, and Duncan is going to have a look at my results. So. It's very interesting to see your results. Yeah, this is what I've been doing. So you've done 30 training sessions, gradually you've seen a yeah. gradual increase in the amount of energy. So the total amount of work that you've been doing because of the electronic flow has increased all the way along. So that's, that's excellent. So if we now go to the test and click the go button, breathe out fully and then a, <laughs> as, as hard and as quickly as you can. That's very good. You've smashed your PB already what? on your first attempt. Oh, the red dotted line is your personal best. So that was 81.59, and there you just achieved 102.84. Well, it's certainly nice to see some progress. If you're climbing mountains, we've seen that just four to six weeks of training with a power breathe device can assist you in terms of acclimatization when you get to base camp. So the thing about altitude is that because of the reduction in air pressure, yes. there's not so much oxygen getting into our lungs in every breath. Absolutely. That's what makes climbing at altitude so difficult because everything becomes so much more of an effort because you're not getting enough oxygen. Yes. So are there ways to train for that? But another way of training is to train in an environment which replicates the environment you're going to. You can train in a tent such as this okay. where that device will reduce the percentage of oxygen to replicate the amount of available oxygen that you would have walking up Everest. There you go, if you'd like, like to go inside the tent. Okay, I'm going to get on the bike. I'm going to try it out. Yep. In this environment, where we're taking the oxygen percentage down, you will find it's a lot harder to perform at the same levels as you would do at sea level. So you're trying to adapt at the same time as you're training. Okay, so it is possible to actually train at altitude. It is and get your body a little bit more used to how it will feel Absolutely. when you're up on the mountain. Yes. You will also probably find out, and this is down to the individuals, whether you actually are ready or not. Some people do suffer from altitude sickness. You may find that you can actually get early indications of that without leaving home. In March 2018, I went back to see Justin and his team for my final fitness test before leaving for Everest. It's gone very well today actually. So when we look at your very first test results, you came in and you had an oxygen consumption at maximum effort of 2.4 litres uh, per minute. So that's 2.4 litres of oxygen every minute going in. And that, that translated to 43 millilitres of oxygen per kilo body weight. But today your oxygen consumption at max went up to 48. 
So that's a significant increase in your, your uh, ability to use oxygen. So is that good then that that goes up? Yeah, because what it therefore means is, if you think about it, I've got a tank that's this big, now I've got a tank that's this big, I've got a little bit more in my reserve if I have to start pushing my body. Um, so technically it suggests your fitness has uh, slightly increased, but with that we're also seeing a, a change in not only your cardiovascular system, but your respiratory system as well. I'm quietly confident because you're going away from this with a, a very good results, be much more economical, uh, see fitter. Um, so from your perspective, you've got to be feeling good. I am, I'm pleased that there has been an improvement. That's definitely a good thing. Good, good. So it looks like there's been a little bit of improvement in my fitness, which is a really good thing. So now just remains to be seen how I will do on the mountain. Fingers crossed. It's been fascinating learning about the science and technology that can help my training and preparation for Everest. I've done what I can. Now we just need to wait and see whether my body can cope on the mountain.